Welcome again to everyone, especially those who are joining us for the first time. It is an absolute joy and privilege having you here with us. Fellowship City is a gospel-centered, disciple-making, transcultural family in the heart of Centurion. We want to see the world awaken to the wonder of God and his transcultural church. We are part of the Fellowship Church movement. Let's double click um, the three things that we just mentioned. Firstly, gospel centered means a life centered and saturated around the truth and the perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and return of Jesus Christ, affirming him as Lord and Savior. We find salvation, meaning purpose, and everlasting life in Jesus Christ alone. Disciple making means that as the gospel transforms the individual life of a person, we want to see a multiplying effect of that in the lives of others, and we believe that happens best in the making of disciples. We are sent to share his love and make disciples who make disciples. Transcultural means having a view of community that reflects, embraces, and enjoys the diversity of its context, and by the power of the gospel transcends it to form one new community in Christ. These are some dense descriptions, so what does this actually look like? Well, we are a family consisting of missional communities of people who commit to living life on life, life in community, and life on mission. Life on mission is very important to us as we want to remain outwardly focused to share the good news with people and invite them into our community. Here is what we will be doing during our time together. We'll be worshiping with San Marie. We'll then hear the word from Orindeni, and then we'll have breakouts for fellowship and discussion. Lastly, we can be found on the internet, so please feel free to contact us. Uh, we have our website, which is www.fellowshipcity.ca.za, and then Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and lastly, you can email us as well. Hope you have a lovely morning. I'm going to pass over to San Marie. Thanks. Good morning, church, and welcome to Fellowship City on this cold morning. And this week in the minus one and twos and one degree Celsius, this song was on repeat in my mind. Maybe you know it. It's an old school song. It's called... Um, a new commandment I give to you. I think I last sang it when I was at primary school. Um, maybe many of you did as well. But this week, the words have become new and fresh in my mind, that this is the commandment. This is the main thing, a new commandment I give unto you. So I welcome you. Our first lot of songs are going to be a medley of some old school favorites um, around, this, around this verse. I would like to read for us from the message how it puts this verse, John 13, verse 34 to 35. Let me give you a new command. Love one another. In the same way I loved you, you love one another. This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples. When they see the love you have for each other. Um, let's pray together. Jesus, from you flow living water. You are the bread of life. You are our source. Thank you for this morning. I pray open our eyes to these truths that we might see you as the source of love, of living waters, of life. Be with us, be in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together the old school medley. We're starting with Gottes Liefde, um, God is Love. Die Brom van Liefde, Liefde. 
That is our prayer that we would live out of the source of life. The one that says, come and I will give you water, living water. So we turn to the source, Jesus, as we say in Jane the Trauma.
text is from Philippians 2 verses 3 to 5, reading from the New International Version. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, thank you, thank you, um, Tandu, um, San Marie, and uh, Bethany. Good morning, church. Um, just a, a, a quick recap as to what we've been working on and what we've been walking through as a church. Um, we're currently on a, doing a series called What Does a Fellowship City Look Like? Um, and uh, a fellowship city is one that nurtures. And then we look at different aspects of, of, of um, what uh, a nurturing uh, fellowship city looks like. So the first week, the Soho walked us through nurturing grace. Then Reino walked us through um, Christ likeness in the second week. And last week, he walked us through empathy and, and compassion. And so this morning, um, we'll be looking at uh, a fellowship city nurtures people first. Good morning. Officially, my name is uh, Mo, and I have the privilege of uh, sharing God's word uh, with you this morning. So as you read, our teaching text is Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. Um, but then we're going to look at a number of different scriptures throughout, throughout our message this morning. And so Philippians 2, 3 to 5 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Um, rather, in humility of mind, value others as above yourselves, not looking only to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And so our teaching text is focusing on what it looks like to think about the other person. Um, to think about others, to, to be more conscious of, of others than to be um, than, than how one is conscious of themselves and their own needs. Uh, this, this past week, the past couple of weeks, in fact, uh, it's, 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 it's been uh, a lot, that, there's been a lot that's been happening, a lot of everything that's been happening around the world with COVID in our country, especially the last few weeks with, with the protests and with the lootings going on. We had a frank discussion as a city group this past week. Um, we're discussing the Christian response, what it looks like, the response um, in light of feelings of sadness, of, of fear, of anger, of, of confusion, prayer, faith, hopelessness, and, and everything in between. Um, and by the way, just to take a little moment to, 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 to plug City Group, if you're not involved in City Group, if you're not a part of City Group right now, um, uh, currently, uh, I encourage you to reach out to, 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 um, to someone that you know in the church, um, to, to Reino, um, to Lesero, uh, you can reach out to, 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 to our email address. Um, please feel free. I think uh, City Group is an amazing time. Uh, for those, uh, we all come from different church backgrounds, so some of us might know it closer to Bible study or home cell, but it's, it's, it's sort of similar to what our breakout sessions feel like in a more intimate setting, um, and we're able to go deep with, 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 uh, within the context of, of church and community, we get to reflect on the word, and then we just get to be ourselves and we get to express ourselves. 
So it's a great time. So I just thought I'd take that moment to plug Citigroup. Please, please, please get into Citigroup. Um, it'll change your lives. And so in light of what we were discussing earlier this week um, in our Citigroup, uh, just trying to process um, Ilana, uh, sort of shout out to Ilana, she, 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 she posted this picture the next day after Citigroup and after we'd been wrestling. And I'm going to put it, well, we're going to put up that, 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 that picture right now. And we felt like it, it captured the essence of, um, of what we had been wrestling with, you know. So, so this is what that picture, I think she says she, she had screenshotted it or she had taken it from somebody else. Um, so yeah, this is what that picture looks like. It says the next time you order takeout, order one extra for the delivery guy. Go to Pep and ask the manager to check if anything, um, if anyone has school clothes on layby. Pay the balance and, and, and remain anonymous to the recipient. Adopt one family and do their grocery essentials for a month. Your helper has a child in high school. Invite them over in the weekends to use the internet for research and maybe tutor if you can. Carry fruit in your car for the car guard. There are a million other ways to make an impact. Moving forward, this world needs us to be kind. Do all this without expectation and in silence. And I mean, that's, that's we, we, a lot of us were just like, wow, that's, that's so good, that's so cool. Um, but these are some of the things we think about in process when we think about what it looks like to put people first. And so this morning we'll look at two points around this conversation of putting people first. Um, around this, this, this notion of nurturing people and building a culture of people first as a church. Um, our first point is to, pe to put people first starts with loving people. And then our second point will be to put people first means to put our love to action. Um, and for the remainder of our message, we'll be focusing on those two points as we look at the sort of the practical uh, implications and application of what it looks like to put people first. Let me pray for us as we get into the reading of God's word together. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, we thank you. We thank you uh, that you've blessed us with another Sunday. Thank you, Lord God, that during a time where so many people are struggling with, with, with health and, and, and um, stability and, and well-being and safety, Lord, that uh, this morning, um, regardless of what our circumstances are, there's a lot we have to be thankful for, Lord. And, and so we thank you that we can meet together as a church community. We thank you, Lord God, that we can worship together, that we can, we can, we can hear the reading of your word together, Lord, um, that we can, we can reflect on, on your word, Lord God. And so I pray that you may be with us this morning. Um, thank you for this series uh, that, that, that allow us, allows us to reflect and process what it looks like to be a fellowship city that nurtures. And this morning, as we look at what it looks like to nurture putting people first, uh, may you open up our hearts and our minds to hearing from you, Lord. May you challenge each of us at an individual level and at a, at a, at a macro community level, Lord God. Um, speak through me this morning, Father. Um, may your spirit just, just focus on specific uh, phrases, words, scriptures this morning, Lord God. Um, your people are here, ready to hear you speak. Speak, oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so... Our first point is to put people first starts with loving people, right? To put people first starts with loving people. Um, we're going to take a look at, at what the Bible has to say about loving people. So we're going to have a look at a couple of scriptures. So, so for the remainder of the message, we're going to be referring to quite a lot of scriptures. So I'm going to ask you to buckle up your seatbelt, take out your pens, um, your, your notepads. For those of you who take uh, notes, uh, get your fingers ready to be typing. Um, there's, there's some pretty interesting and pretty cool scriptures we'll be looking at this morning. So our first one that, that, we're, that we're going to look at is Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40. Jesus was asked, which is the greatest commandment? And this is how he responded. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang up on these two commandments. So before we even get to this point of putting people first, we need to draw from who God is and the love of God for us and, and, and allow our serving and allow our interactions with others to be an overflow. I just felt this morning to the need to emphasize that, that the, the way we interact with people, especially during difficult times, must be an overflow. Have a look at 1 John 4 verses 19 to 21. Um, and it says, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or a sister is a liar. 
For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he, and, and, and he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. You know, when I first read this, I think I was exposed to this like a couple of years ago, I was like, ouch. It's all good and well for us to say we love because he first loved us. Yes, Lord, praise the Lord. But the second part of it is, is, is what we don't always get right. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or a sister is a liar. Whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Right. And so this command that he gives is that, that that is spoken about here is in reference to John 13 verses 34 to 35. Saint Mary read it this morning. These are the words of Jesus. A new command I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You see, church, at the end of the day, we need to realize that loving people is a command. It's not a recommendation. It's not good. It's not best practice. Uh, it's not when you feel like it. It's a command from Jesus. Loving people is at the core of who we are as believers in Jesus. And so that's the first part, right? So in, in, in putting people first, it starts with loving people. Then we look at what love looks like. What does it look like, particularly with the reference um, and with reference to loving others? So we know that scripture talks about the importance of loving. We know that God commands us to love. The question then is, what, as we get into, into this mode of seeing the practical application of what putting people first looks like and what loving people looks like, let's have a look at, at, at scripture and see what, what, what God says about what love looks like. So the, 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 the ultimate verse that we typically know when we're younger, when we're non-Christians, is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his, own, his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God loved us so much that he gave his one and only son. 1 John 3, 16 Ironically, I don't know if you saw that John 3.16 and then 1 John 3.16 has a sort of a similar theme. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So here we see that Jesus loved us. And because of that love, he laid down his life for us. And so we've been instructed to lay down our lives for others. So, so loving someone has sacrifice. There's always an aspect of sacrifice. We see this with God himself. God loved, so he gave. He didn't keep, he gave. Jesus loved, so he laid down. He didn't preserve, he laid down his life for us. So whenever we think about loving and sort of the practical overflow of loving, there's a sacrifice component. And we've seen the, in, in the Old Testament, there was always this, 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 this practice of offering, giving offerings, giving your, your tenth, the first of what you owe, offering it before God, right, as a, as a sign of honor and reverence to God. But there's this consistently throughout scripture and in our Christian faith, there's this understanding that we give, we share, we, 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 we're, we're kind with, we hand over. And so we see this again in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. So Philippians 2, 3, and 4 um, spoke about what sort of not looking at our own interests, but looking at the interests of others and valuing others more than ourselves. And then in verse 5, then it talks about Jesus Christ. So I'm going to read verse 5 to 8. It says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature. So before we even get into this mindset of Jesus, the, the sort of the, the pretext is Jesus loves us. Jesus loved us, right? So we read verse five within that context of Jesus's love for us as his creation and as his children, right? If ever there was any doubt, church, God loves you so much. Jesus loves you so much. Okay, so Philippians 2 verse five. In light of the fact that Jesus loves us, right? 
says, had the same mindset as Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. No, no, no. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. There's this notion that he didn't hold on to the, the, the status that he had with God, right? He didn't hold on to the, 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 the comfortable life that he had um, in, in, in this other realm. But he gave that all up because he loved us to come to the sinful world. He gave that all up. And he didn't even come as a king right? He's king, but he didn't take the position of a king on a throne. So he came down to earth. He sacrificed in that first place coming down. He sacrificed even further, but the Bible says he took the, 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 the position of a servant. He came as one to serve. I was reading uh, Matthew, I think it was Matthew 20 or Matthew 19 earlier this week, and I was just touched by the fact that it says, um, when, 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 when the, the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus and said, give us, I think the mom said, give us a position of honor next to you, Lord Jesus, on our right and on, our, on your right and on your left. Jesus then said, for those of you who want to be great amongst you must come to serve. For kings lord it over those that they serve or those that they lead. But the one who wants to be the greatest amongst you must be your servant. Right? So we see Jesus putting his, his words to action. Right? I'm so I, I, I go back to the scripture as soon as you drop it. So we're going to go back to Philippians 2, 5 to 8. But, but, but what we see here is God sent his son, Jesus, and Jesus then didn't give up. Um, he, he, or rather, he gave up what, what was rightfully his for the sake of serving us, right? He put his love to action. Then I wanted to read this. So, so, so I wanted to focus on Philippians 2, 5 to 8, but this is one of the most beautifully written pieces of scripture that talks about Jesus Christ. And I, would, I can't read this, this verse and not read verses 8 to 11. So, so follow with me. Therefore, God exalted Jesus in the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That has nothing to do with the sermon this morning. I just felt like this is, so Philippians 2 verse 5 to 11 is, is, is one of those beautiful scriptures that just talks about Jesus, who Jesus is as our Lord and Savior, and what will happen sort of at the end of time, right? But verses 5 to 8, we see then that Jesus loved us, sacrificed for us to experience his love, right? We know that ultimately his sacrifice allowed us to be restored with Christ. Philippians 2, 3, and 4 now, in light of that, so as we go back a couple of verses to verses 3 and 4, in light of understanding that with love then come certain actions, right? We then see, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, and rather with humility of mind, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So now we start to see that we read that scripture within the context context of recognizing and understanding that we love first, we love God, then we love others. And then there's certain actions that overflow. To put people first to, to, is to love them. To love them is to sacrifice. And that has to do with looking out for people's needs, not just our own. And in fact, oftentimes more so for theirs. We have the mind and the heart of Jesus, right? As we see in verse five, we have to have a heart for people. This is linked to what Reno was preaching last week around, around empathy. Hey, that, that, that Greek word that he mentioned, splach nizomai, I think, you know, splach nizomai. Um, compassion, empathy. Jesus was so often moved with compassion. So before he took an action, there was a movement in his heart. We saw this. If you haven't had the chance to listen to last week's sermon, please take the time to do so. But what we learned last week is the fact that we nurture empathy, but we learn and we see empathy from Jesus. Every single time he acted, there was, a, there was a moment of the heart being moved, the heart being tugged at. And, and, and that, that then leads to a more organic kind of service, right? When we have a heart for people, church, when we love people first, we don't have to be asked or be told 
to serve them or to put them first. It comes as an overflow. And the second part, our second point will sort of emphasize um, what we're looking at right now, because our second point is to put people first means to put our love to action. To put people first means to put our love to action. So I love my wife. I really do. Um, but it's not enough for me just to tell her that I love her. In, in, in a perfect world, in an ideal world, it's enough to say I love her. It's enough to say to someone you love them. But we live in a fallen world. And, and unfortunately, people say they love people or they care for people, but their actions just don't align. So typically, I love my wife, but she's got to see that I love her with, with, with the actions that I take. And it serves more so as an effect, as a result of my love which then can sort of confirm and act as a proof for my love. Let me illustrate that with a picture. I'm sure you a picture here this morning. Okay, so in the Fala household, eh, dishes, dishes, dishes are, dishes are a topic, put it that way, you know? Um, dishes, dishes are just one of those things. And that's because for me, my, my, my relationship with dishes goes way back, you know? So, so I look at this picture and Every single time I see like a couple of dishes, you know, I'm, I'm giving you or bringing you in to the Nefale household, sensitive information is about to come out now. So every time I see like a few dishes, in my mind, it looks like this picture. I just, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm flawed, right? So I, I have this relationship with dishes where I'll see dishes and it just feels like, yo, these dishes are so many. And like, there's this trauma that I have with dishes and, but I just end up not doing dishes, right? Like I just, I don't like dishes. So, so my wife, I know my wife often would love for me to do the dishes. So I've been challenged sort of the past couple of months because I've been working from home more than I have before. And the, the Lord has sort of convicted me to, to, to do the loving thing and to do the dishes just, just randomly, just because, you know, because I can. And you know, the smile on my wife, and um, when she sees um, the dishes are done out of the blue, unexpected, you know, it's, it's priceless. But again, I don't want to do the dishes. If I were to be given the choice to do the dishes, I would say no, without doubt. If, every single time I'd say no. But every single time I need to be motivated and pushed to say no, but I love my wife. And dishes is one of those little things. I can do the big things. I lay down my, my life for my wife. I'll sacrifice in so many other ways, but this one, I know. And that's often how it looks for us in our relationships with people. It's, 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 it's the big things, we want the big gestures, but our love is typically shown and seen in the little things, in the small acts of kindness, the small acts of love. Again, sort of one's love, one's, one's articulation of love is seen in one's actions. Show me you care for me. Don't just tell me. I think there's, there's, there's an expression there. And so as we look at the definition of love in the Bible, it's linked to this taking action. It's linked to this aspect of action accompanying the love that we claim to have. And so, uh, thank you, thank you, so we can put that, that picture down. And so, as we look then at, at, at the, 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 the Old Testament, right? So, Matthew twenty two thirty seven 37 to 40, Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? So, the great commandment, as they call it, all the law and the prophets hang on these two. Now, those two scriptures, those two words, though, those phrases, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, is actually taken from, 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 from what we know to be the Old Testament scriptures. Remember, Jesus was raised on the Jewish scriptures, right? What we call the Old Testament, but it was the Tanakh, right? It, 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 it was the Jewish scriptures. And we see first this expression of love God with all your heart in Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. So Deuteronomy 6 is known as Shema Israel, hear O Israel, right? It's a prayer that, 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 that Jews pray. Hear O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Uh, have this teaching and these commands on your heart. Impress them on your children. Talk about it when you sit down. Talk about it when you walk. Put it on your doorpost in your household, hanging around your neck. That command on, of love God with all your heart, soul, and mind is foundational in the Jewish custom, in the people of Israel. 
So when Jesus is referencing it, they know it very well. Now, the use of the word love there, right? And again, in Leviticus 19, 18, where Jesus references this, this, this notion of love your neighbor as yourself. So love your neighbors from Leviticus 19, 18. In both those scriptures, the Hebrew word that's used there is ahab. And it's actually, it actually has a simple definition. It means having affection for someone. Right? So that, that word is used among other Hebrew words for love, but in certain scriptures when it uses that word, it also references God's love for us and our love for him. Simple definition, to have affection for. And typically then it's accompanied by how one co communicates, how one is committed to the person that they have affection for. But in the purest sense, it's not that deep. It's the kind of love that says you have affection for. So, it's, so it means have affection for. But now I want to show you what it looks like in the Greek. So in the Greek, what we see of the word love is agape. So a number of us would have heard that, that, that Greek uh, sort of definition of love, agape. Um, there's, there's, there's four other words that can be used for love, phileo, eros, agape, storge, and then there are other sort of as you go broader, there are other definitions, other words that can be used for love. But this one is the, the, the word that was used, used here is agape. It's typically the word that is used when it's spoken of God's love for his people. Now, the definition of agape then is also, by the way, to have affection for, right? But that's one part of the definition, to have affection for someone. Then in agape, it adds the word benevolence. What we know about benevolence is it's, it's acts of kindness or, or, or acting kindly towards someone. Right? So you see now in the definition of love, it associates this action component. You don't just love in speech, but you love in action. And, 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 and in, in, in a deeper definition, as you look at the, the definitions of agape, it says it's the effect and the proof of love, right? It's the effect and the proof of affection, the proof of one's love, love through action. Love takes action, folks. Love acts. It practically has actions attached to it. So again, when we look at Philippians 2, 3, and 4, this, this speaks to the mindset that we have in expressing our love for people. We do nothing out of selfish ambition. Our default is to be selfish, right? We do nothing out of vain conceit. It's not about me. Rather, in humility, we value others above ourselves. We don't only look at our own interests. And, and, and there's another version that says we don't only look at our own interests. So it's not to say you neglect the well-being and the needs and the interests of your family and your loved ones. No, no, no. It says you don't look only at your own interests, but you also look at the interests of others. So now we start to see that as we look at this passage, it, it starts to take a practical application. We're going to look at a few more verses and, and as we close and as we, we're going to go into breakouts and discuss and reflect, I think scripture is very clear about what love looks like. So we're going to look at uh, Matthew 25 verse 35 to, to 14. This is what it says. Jesus is sort of giving in, in the last few parts of the, the, the gospel of Matthew, he starts to say the kingdom of God is like this, the kingdom of God is like that. Sort of the end times will be like this and like that. And says, it'll be like a king who brings his people together and then he'll separate them from right to left, sheep and goat, right? And this is one of the key criteria that he references. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? Then the king will, rep will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So in other words, those that were allowed to be with the king are those who served the people, those who showed expressions of love in action. Right, the, 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 the righteous here are like, when did we see you and, and, and feed you? When did we see you and do all these things? It's like, no, 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 don't worry. As you went about your normal life and you served people day to day, you were actually serving me. 
you're actually caring for me. And then those who are on the other side, they're like, when didn't we see you and we didn't help you? He says, every single time you didn't help someone, you actually didn't help me. It's an expression of love. 1 John 3 verses 16 to 18, this is what it says. So this is how we know what love is. So we read verse 16, right? Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and our sisters. We often think, oh yes, Lord, if, if the time comes, I'll lay down my life. Sort of a drastic example. But look at this, it says, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or a sister in need, but has no pity on them, that, that, that word pity is linked to empathy and compassion. Splach Nizomai, as, 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 as Reino mentioned, this notion of being moved with compassion. So if somebody isn't moved with compassion, how can the love of God be in that person? So it's not to say, if you see someone in need and you don't help them, then how can the love of God be in you? No, 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 notice it says, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. There's the scripture for you, church. If you thought I didn't know what I was talking about this whole time, there you go, in the word of God, 1 John 3, 18. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. That's what it looks like to put people first. This, this scripture had me thinking about James 2, 15 to 17, where, 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 where the author talks about faith and, 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 and deeds. It says, suppose a brother, I, I didn't put it up here, but, but just listen with me, James 2, 15 to 7. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Church, during city group earlier this week, I shared with, with, with the city group, I shared with my wife a couple of weeks ago, like I was just so convicted um, during the past couple of weeks in our country. I was like, Lord, I know that prayer is enough. You are enough but I know that I sometimes hide behind this notion of prayer is enough. I read James 2, 15 to 17, I'm convicted. I'm like, it's, it's, it's not enough because I know that there's something I can actually do. There's something practical that I can apply to. I can love people from a distance, but there are practical things that we can do, church. And again, my conviction was based on the fact that like, I'm like, Lord, I, I know that there's more that I can do. And so we're wrestling with what does it look like and what do you do? And so to put people first means we need to put our love to action because love acts. Just two images I want to show you. There's a gentleman by the name of Bob Goff. He's, a, he's an old gentleman, American guy. He was an attorney for a couple of decades, then he retired and then he started doing a lot of mission work and going to, 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 to developing countries, poorer communities. He would go to South America, the Central Americas, um, to, to some countries in Africa, to Asia. He would just, he was just, his, his, his passion is acting on the love of God. He says, I've experienced the love of God and my conviction for the remainder of my life to respond in, in kind to respond with the same love that I experienced. So this is what he says, quit waiting for a plan, just go love everybody. That's his whole thing. There's another picture that says, it's, 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 it says yeah, love doesn't just think about it. Love doesn't just plan it, love does it. The name of his book is Love Does. Love does. So he's all about taking action. As Christians, sometimes we confine ourselves. We hide behind these moments. And the beauty of us as Christians, churches, we have the privilege of the Spirit of God. So this message, church, these, these scriptures, this putting people first, it's never going to be exactly the same for each of us. And that's a beauty. Praise the Lord that expressions of his Spirit in each one of us is different. So my ask and my plea, same prayer that I prayed for myself is, Lord, what does this look like for me? So during the series as a church, we're, we're looking at what these qualities look like for us as, as, as individuals. And then very importantly, us as a church community. Right? You'll see in the questions, it'll look at both. What does it look like for us to love? To put others first. 
as an individual first, as a member of a city group, as a member of a church, and for us to have that overflow into the greater um, city, the greater country. Um, I was going to show the picture we looked at earlier, but uh, I'd rather end on, on a scripture. Um, if we can put up 1 John 3, 17 to 18 again, 16 to 18. <clears throat> And, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that for us, and we'll read that together as a church, and I'm going to close off in prayer for us. My heart for us this morning, church, what's been just so heavy on my heart and what the Lord has been impressing on me is it all starts with love. It all starts with love. We're reminded that we love because he first loved us. First and foremost, we have a, a longing and a thirst for Jesus. We experience his love. Then we go, we take that love and we go and we love others. That's how we put people first. We just love them. We get to know them. We get to see them as those made in the image of God who moved with compassion the same Christ was, the same way Christ was. And so we don't, we don't have to be concerned about getting it right, church. We don't have to be concerned about always saying the right things. We might misspeak. That's okay. As long as people know that we love them. As long as people know that it comes from a place of love. More often than not, it'll be based on relationship. But church, let's just love. Like Bob Goff says, let's not overthink it and over-spiritualize it. Just go out there and love. What does that look like? Look at the life of Jesus. 1 John 3, it says, this is how we know what love is. Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. What does this look like then? Practically, if anyone has material possessions, and that doesn't have to be money only, church, whatever possessions that looks like. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or a sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us love not with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this day, Lord, to thank you for the gift of your word, Lord. Thank you that we can turn to your word and it can just uh, sort of challenge us and encourage us, Lord. So I pray this morning, Heavenly Father, that as a church, as individual believers in Christ, we can hear your word, think through and apply what it looks like on a day-to-day -day basis, Lord. Help us remember that to put people first starts with loving them. And to put people first means that we put our love to action. Philippians 2 verse 5, Lord, may we have this mindset, may we have this attitude that we saw in Christ, <laughs> where you laid down your life, 1 John 3, you laid down your life for us. So be with us as a church, bless us this morning, pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we just come before you today so grateful for the opportunity to joy to gather together and just encourage one another and share life together and um, just share practical ways that we can be loving one another and loving outside of our church, Lord. Lord, we know that the last few weeks in our country have been brutal. We know that um, we are all struggling with our own trauma and our own pain. And uh, we are grappling, Lord, to, what, to understand what it means to love and to serve and to still cling to Christ in, in the unknown and the uncertainty and um, the pain of um, our reality as, as it is at the moment, Lord. We see suffering in a way that many of us have never seen suffering before. 
and um, we are really we are really struggling with that Lord and I just pray that you would give us the peace that we need as a church you would give us peace as individuals and that you would just give us the tools and equip us to go out and to show Christ in every way and in every area Lord break our hearts for what breaks yours mm -hmm. lord help us to be kingdom focused even when we feel completely overwhelmed even when we feel completely broken and inadequate help us to see you lord and help us to remember that you are enough and that mm -hmm. you are working even when it feels very bleak and very dark i just pray that we would find our strength and our hope in you and as we go forward lord we would truly embrace what it means to live out christ in our everyday lives and to really be committed to living out the gospel lord i pray this in your wonderful precious name amen
Amen. Amen. We'll bring our service to a close um, with a benediction, a blessing, a good word from John 13, verses 34 to 35. Reading from the NIV, it reads, A new command I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Thank you, Tandiwe. Um, and thank you everyone for uh, joining us this morning for our service. Um, I pray that you we're blessed as we are all blessed and um, have a good, good day further. Grace and peace to you all.